Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and this is a wrap up of every single book I have read so far this year, which sounds a lot more dramatic than it actually is because uh, I have read a total of nine books so far in the first three and a half months of 2020. Um, so I kind of stopped doing monthly wrap ups a while ago uh, because I just didn't feel like it basically. I didn't really see the point in continuing a series of videos that I didn't enjoy making. So I just stopped doing them. And then this year, I really haven't been reading that much. Basically, what happened was that I didn't read anything in the first three months of the year. And then lockdown happened. And then I started obsessively reading dystopian fiction. So anyway, today I want to talk about the nine new books that I have read this year. I have done a little bit of rereading as well, but I'm not going to talk about that. Also, if you want to skip to a particular book, then um, check out the description box where you will find a full list of the books I'm talking about with links and with timestamps, so you can jump directly to the book that you're interested in. The first book I finished was actually a buddy read, which I did with Katie from Books and Things and Marissa from Blatantly Bookish, and that is A Passage to India by Ian e. Forster. Now, this was the last Forster novel that I hadn't yet read, so it was a little bit of a bittersweet experience, knowing that I'll never discover a new Ian e. Forster novel ever again. Very sad. But I really enjoyed uh, reading this with the two lovely booktubers. This novel was first published in 1924 and I believe it was the last Ian Forster novel to be published before he just stopped writing novels. And it follows a uh, Indian doctor named Dr. Aziz who gets to know some English uh, colonialists essentially. And um, among them is the elderly Mrs. Moore and her soon-to-be daughter-in-law, Adela, as well as Minerva, as well as the schoolmaster, Cyril Fielding. And Dr. Aziz takes these English men and women onto an excursion to the nearby Marabar Caves, where something happens that kind of throws everyone's lives upside down. And the rest of the book is about how everyone is dealing with this situation. But like many E.M. Forster novels, the plot is kind of nothing more than a way of getting the characters to interact with each other under specific circumstances. And uh, most E.M. Forster novels really rely on the strength of the characters, the strength of their relationships, the dialogue and the interactions between people. And this one is no exception. The characters are wonderful. It's a, such an interesting setting, 1920s India, and um, I really enjoyed reading that. Now, I have to say, in the ranking of Ian e. Forster novels, this one will probably be on the lower end. I didn't enjoy it as much as some of his other books, but all Ian e. Forster novels are wonderful. This one's no exception, and I very happily gave it four stars. By the way, if you are interested in my overview over all six Ian e. Forster novels, I did a video called Where to Start with Ian e. Forster, which I'll link for you in the description box if you're interested in that. So I finished uh, A Passage to India, I think, in March. I didn't finish any new books in January or February. And then next up, I jumped straight into a week-long readathon about classic dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction which I ran. It's called End of the World Week, and I'll link the playlist about that in the description box as well. But the first book I finished for that was one that I had actually been reading for... Let's check Goodreads. Yeah, I started that one in... in May 2019. So it took me almost a whole year to finish reading A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess. That is a dystopian novel first published in 1962. It follows a violent teenager named Alex. It's in, written in first person perspective and is written in this particular teenage slang that Alex and his friends talk. So it's quite difficult to actually understand because I mean, English is already my second language and reading this weird made up slang is like learning a whole third language on top of that. 
Um, it's very violent, it's very gory, it's very gruesome, it's got a kind of twisted sort of humour about it. It's often described as a satirical novel, but honestly, I don't quite get what it's supposed to satirise. For me, satire always has a particular political point, and I suppose the political point in A Clockwork Orange is that violence bad, but politics also bad. I, I'm not sure how much that really holds up as a deep kind of satire, but it certainly has a, a, a twisted kind of irony about it. I mean, it's hard to judge a book that it took me a whole year to read, but I think once I got to about halfway or two thirds of the way, I started getting it, you know? Before that, I didn't quite get what this book, book was meant to be, but after a while, I thought, yeah, I get you, I get this story, I get this character. So it ended on a three-star rating, but it's not a book that I will reread, I don't think, and I would only really recommend it if you are particularly interested in 20th century dystopian fiction like I am. It's I can see why it's an important book, I can see why it made the big splash that it did, and it's a very unique book. I've ne read nothing like it since or before. Um, but enjoyable, it wasn't. So three stars because of the value that I got out of it, but I didn't get much actual reading enjoyment out of it. It is a very cleverly written book though. Then the third book, and I, I read this as part of End of the World Week, but really it isn't a dystopia in the traditional sense. Uh, the third book I read was Der Prozess by Franz Kafka, or The Trial in English, and this is one of uh, Kafka's most well-known novels, although it is unfinished. It's very odd. I mean, obviously it's very odd. It's Kafka. This one was published in 1925, by the way, and the reason why it isn't a dystopia is because it isn't outwardly declared that this is a new kind of world order, that this is a new system and new society that the main character finds himself in. But he does get drawn into this really surreal judicial world. And to me, that had the same kind of strangeness to it uh, as dystopian fiction does. So that's why I included this in End of the World Week. This one technically was a reread and I said I'm not going to talk about rereads, but the first time I read it, I read about 15 pages when I was in school. I didn't really finish it. Um, again, I'd done a whole video about how I was a terrible student and didn't finish books in school, link in the description box. But this one felt like a new read because I really couldn't remember that much from the first time I supposedly read it in school. Uh, this follows the uh, banker named Josef K. as he suddenly finds himself arrested one morning. He doesn't know what for and the court that's trialing him doesn't seem to be the kind of standard court as he would expect. And at first he doesn't really take this arrest very seriously because he's like, well, I haven't done anything. But then he gets sucked into this judicial world more and more and he becomes the defendant that uh, that this court made him and he still doesn't know what's going on exactly but he gets drawn into it this really surreal strange abstract system of law if you've read any kafka previously then then you'll know what this is going to be like uh, it's fine it's interesting, kind of like A Clockwork Orange. I enjoyed the language and the style and the surrealism. I even enjoyed the humour because I think people don't often talk about the humour in Kafka, but some of the bits are so odd that they are funny. They're so overdrawn, they're so weird that it becomes its own kind of humour. And I enjoyed that. But the story is really made up of fragments. There isn't really a plotline that draws you through the book. I think the biggest change really is in the main character himself and his, in his own attitude to this court process that he suddenly finds himself in. So again, I gave it three stars. I, I'm glad I read it. It was interesting. And actually by the end, 
I got sucked into this process as well. You know, you start off reading this book going, what even is this? And then by the end, you are almost as much a part of this trial court as the main character is. And that was very cleverly done and very interesting. But again, not enjoyable for me in the truest sense of the word. Next up, I finished another really weird dystopian novel. And this one is called Swastika Night. Uh, the author is called Catherine Burdekin. And this is a dystopian novel published in 1937 that uh, imagines a world in which Hitler won. Now again, 1937 was before the start of World War II, so that's the fact that really made me want to pick up Swastika Night. It is actually set hundreds of years in the future from the 20th century. I think it's set around the 27th, 28th century. It's set in a world that is dominated by two major powers, the Germans and the Japanese. But the book is set in the German part of the world. The main character... Oh, it's hard to tell who the main character is. The, there are three characters, really, that make this story. The first one is a German, and he is very much grown up in this Nazi world, and he... Um, you know, he believes in this idea of Hitler as a god, which is kind of the main religion that is driving this dystopian society. The second character is an Englishman who is obviously one of the oppressed peoples in this world. And then the third one is, well, he's called a knight, but really he's a member of the aristocracy and also a German. And nothing much happens in this book other than some of those people plotting a sort of overthrowing of the system, like is the case in many dystopian novels, right? But really the book is mostly a vessel for the author to express some philosophical ideas about all sorts of things, including gender. Gender is actually a really big part of this world because while the men are kind of mostly free to do what they like, the women are literally kept like animals and uh, obviously this is a very overdrawn very extreme version of uh, a gender divide but everything in this book is so overdrawn and over the top that you can kind of almost see it like a, a cautionary tale or a fable to express certain ideas it also discusses the idea of kind of national identity and personal identity. And I found those aspects quite interesting. I was a bit disappointed in the lack of plot and in the lack of character development because all of the characters kind of start off the same way that, you no, know, end the same way as they start off without going through a big personal change. The main part of the book really is dialogue, is people interacting and exchanging ideas and discussing certain philosophies and certain um, theories and talking about humanity in these particular ways. The one thing that is really missing when you imagine a world ruled by Nazis is anti-Semitism. There's like one paragraph about how the Nazis killed all the Jews and then that's it. And that, I wish, was made a topic a little bit more because in place of the Jews you have Christians as the oppressed belief, as the oppressed religion, which to me is a bit of a cop-out. Again, I, I'm i not well versed enough in history to know how much of the Holocaust was known uh, in 1937 England, which is where this book was first written and published. So Maybe um, this would be better discussed by a historian of the 20th century who knows all of the details and all of the context. In fact, I've seen that there have been a few academic papers written about this novel, and I'm interested enough in it to um, print those off at some point when I have access to a printer and read through them, because I feel like there's so much more to this novel than just the kind of 
mediocre story that I got from it. So I gave this book three stars, again similar to the first two dystopians novels that I've discussed now. It's super interesting concept, really fascinating. I would recommend it if you are interested just in this concept, in the concept of someone in the middle of the 1930s writing a book that is set in a Nazi future. As a novel itself, I found it a bit lacking. Next up is the final book I finished for End of the World Week and my personal highlight of the week. And this is The Kraken Wakes by John Wyndham. This was first published in 1953. And I love this so much. Um, I've given it four stars, but I might actually change that to five because even after finishing the book, I'm still thinking about it and how brilliant it is. This is a... a post-apocalyptic slash apocalyptic story which follows a husband and wife team of radio reporters who suddenly find themselves in a rapidly changing world. I say rapidly changing but actually the plot of the story is very slow moving. At the beginning of the book we realize that this is kind of a flashback to an earlier time. Mike, who's one of the two reporters, is looking back at the first signs that something was changing in the world. He describes how there have been these kind of suspicious looking meteorites, these kind of red stars that seem to be falling into the sea. And then sometime later, it seems like something is alive in the depths of the ocean, in the dark, cold depths that is staking a claim on the planet and uh, the theories are that maybe these are some sort of aliens from Jupiter that have launched themselves across the solar system and have settled in the in the depths of the ocean and are now starting to invade the planet from the sea. It's a hilariously camp concept. I, I like the over-the-top feeling of these kind of sea monsters coming out alien sea monsters and taking the planet and killing people and this kind of warfare going on between humans and these creatures that they haven't even ever seen. And all of this is documented by the two main characters, Mike and Phyllis, who, like I said, work for a radio network as journalists. And they are really the reason why I loved this book. Mike is the first person narrator of this. Uh, but his wife is very much a main character as well. And I love the dynamic between them. And this is something that I don't see a lot of in modern literature, never mind in 1950s literature. But it is a couple that is in love and that has a relationship based on respect. Because Phyllis is a damn good reporter and she is the one who does a lot of the footwork, who does a lot of the investigating, who finds a lot of the answers. And you can tell how, again, how respectful their relationship is. She is just a very unique female character in 20th century science fiction. And I really love reading about her. It was such a breath of fresh air. And I can highly recommend this book if you are into this kind of competent female character. I don't want to use the word strong female character because that is cliche ridden by itself, but just a competent adult woman who knows her place in the world, even if that world is 1950s England. Really, really loved that. The other thing I loved about this book is that the plot is very, it's quite slow moving, right? Not much happens. And that is, again, a nice change from the typical post-apocalyptic storyline where suddenly disasters, bombs, explosions, krakens, death, you know, all of these things happen quite fast. And they kind of happen in this book as well, but at a much slower pace. It's just a much kind of smaller world approach to the whole post-apocalyptic story. So if you're into post-apocalyptic stories, if you enjoyed The Day of the Triffids by my, uh, by John Wyndham, then I would highly recommend uh, The Kraken Wakes as well. Again, just really loved this one. Then, 
after I finished reading classic post-apocalyptic and dystopian fiction, I still craved more dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction, so I turned to contemporary dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction. And a lot of you uh, send me some recommendations on Instagram, which I'm really grateful for. The first book I picked up, one that almost everyone recommended, was Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. And this was published a few years ago, in 2014. And this is a sort of book that I had been hearing about on Booktube a lot. One could say it's a very hyped novel. And I agree with the hype. I really enjoyed this one. This is a um, slightly unfortunately timed read about a, a world in which a virus wipes out most of humanity. Sorry. But the story isn't actually that concerned with the whole virus wiping out 99% of humanity thing because it's set in two different timelines. One of them is 20 years after the event where the world is your typical post-apocalyptic universe really. It's kind of barren and people are fighting for survival and that timeline follows a group of actors and musicians called the Travelling Symphony and that part follows the Travelling Symphony as they have some conflict with a strange, uh, violent cult. The other timelines are set much further in the past and they mostly revolve around the life of a Hollywood star and his sort of friends and family, if you like. The event itself, the whole virus story, is just kind of serves to separate those two worlds and those two timelines. I really enjoyed this book because I liked reading a story that really discusses the value of art, the value of content, if you like, because in a world that's post-apocalyptic, that doesn't have any communication, doesn't have any internet, doesn't even have any electricity, something like live music and live drama becomes such an important part of people's lives. And I, as both a, I guess, a content creator and a, a musicologist, really enjoyed reading that um, story about how much value uh, art and music brings into people's lives, both the performers and the audiences. But I also liked the flashback sequences. I liked seeing this kind of network of relationships and of people and how something can change those human relationships. It's a very inward looking book. It's a very slow paced and very thoughtful book. I would have given this five stars because I was really, really sucked into it, except I just didn't like the sort of multi narrative, multi perspective kind of mashup. And it makes it harder for me to really get immersed in a character. I, I wish this um, author would have picked just one perspective and told the whole story from one person rather than jumping from character to character. But that is just a personal take. I still really love this book. I still gave it four stars and I would highly recommend it if it doesn't hit too close to home right now because I totally understand why some of you might not want to read a book about a global pandemic right now. But then again, I can say that the global pandemic doesn't play that huge a part in the actual plot. It doesn't take up much space. The virus does not get much screen time in the story. It just set, serves as a cutting event to separate the first world, the first timeline and the first set of characters with the second world, the second timeline and the second set of characters. Next up, I read the first three books uh, out of a post-apocalyptic young adult series. Uh, the series is called The Last Survivors series and it's by Susan Beth Pfeffer. So I'm just going to talk you through the three books that I read from that series. The first one, and this is again one that's been recommended to me quite a lot, is called Life As We Knew It. 
And in this story, uh, we read the diary, it's a diary style novel, which I always enjoy. We read the diary of a 16 year old girl named Miranda. She lives in Pennsylvania uh, in the sometime in the mid 2000s because this book was published in 2006. She's actually my age. Uh, I was 15 in 2006, she's 16 in 2006. And um, her world changes from one day to the next as a meteor hits the moon and knocks it closer to Earth. So then the gravitational pull of the moon causes all sorts of natural disasters, floods, hurricanes, volcano eruptions, the sun gets obscured and crops don't grow anymore. You know, your typical post-apocalyptic world. And through the diary, we follow Miranda as she changes from a person who's mostly worried about not having a date for junior prom to someone who is literally fighting for survival and trying to keep herself and her family alive. I really enjoyed this one. I thought it was such a fantastic take on the post-apocalyptic idea of survivalism by looking at it through the eyes of a teenage girl. I always like dystopian and post-apocalyptic stories told from the perspective of young people because as a child and a teenager you just adapt to new situations so much quicker and it was really interesting to see that change happen from a very personalized perspective because it is her diary and I thought the tone was spot on the kind of change from this girl being worried about the um, figure skating star she has a crush on to this girl being worried about whether herself, her mother and her brothers are going to survive another day was really quite striking and really well done. I really, really enjoyed this one. I gave it five stars and then I instantly picked up the second in the series. Now, the second in the series is called The Dead and the Gone and this one isn't really a sequel, but a alternate perspective on the same events because we follow the same events meteor knocking the moon out of orbit and so on but this time we follow a 17 year old boy who lives in New York City this is Alex and uh, it isn't a diary style narration this time it is just a kind of third person narrative but we follow him and his thoughts as he tries and protect his sisters uh, his parents have disappeared likely dead because he suddenly doesn't hear anything from them and he is again fighting for survival fighting for the lives of his family but in a different world and different circumstances to Miranda in the first book. I enjoyed this almost as much as the first. I thought the character of Alex was realistically unlikable, not someone I'd like to meet in real life um, and his struggle was very different to that from Miranda in the first book, but at the same time quite similar. And and obviously it's about how in a post-apocalyptic scenario your needs become very basic. Food, warmth and shelter. And getting those needs in New York City is very different to getting them in rural Pennsylvania. So I really enjoyed this one as well. Um, very heartbreaking in parts because obviously there is a lot of death and disaster around and in some ways I found this book more affecting than Station Eleven even though Station Eleven is about a global pandemic. You're just kind of more into it because you're following one person's struggle and you get attached to this person and the family and the people around them. So really like this one as well. Not quite as much as the first one, but I still gave this one four stars and then instantly bought the third book, which is called This World We Live In. And this was such a disappointment that I don't think I'll actually bother reading the fourth book in the series, unless you tell me that the fourth book is better than the third, because this was... Mmm. No. No. So, let's not get ahead of ourselves. The third book follows the two characters from the first and the second book. Uh, again, we are reading Miranda's diary and her life kind of collides with that of Alex from the second book. 
and again it's about survival it's about relationships it's about getting used to a new way of life it seems like all of the characters from the first two books have been replaced by robots that only vaguely act like them i don't know why the author seems to have lost her grip on these characters but they are just like flat representations of their former selves um alex from the second book loses all depth and three-dimensionality um never mind the minor characters from the second and first book that just become caricatures and then and i cannot for the life of me understand why this made it to publishing why the editor at least didn't say something like maybe my dear susan you shouldn't endorse eugenics in your young adult novel because that's exactly what she does in the third book. I don't want to spoil this book, but at some point the main character actively engages in eugenics and it is not portrayed as a critical in a critical way. It is not discussed um as a not just a mistake but a horrible thing to do. And in fact it is portrayed as a, as a positive as as a brave choice that the main character made and that's put me off so much that i am just furious with the author for writing this garbage and um that i am not planning to continue the series if you know what i'm talking about comment down below did, did this just rub you the wrong way as well because i don't think this is okay to write mm. Even without the whole eugenics thing, it's not a great book and I only gave this two star and really that was the only truly disappointing read that I've had so far this year. Right, this video is already long enough so I'm going to finish this off now. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to get back to a sort of wrap-up type format. It really depends on how much I'm reading but I expect that what I'm going to do from now on is just sporadically do these kind of what I read recently updates, when I have a decent amount of books to talk about and when I have something to say about those books. But yeah, let me know what you think of this type of video. The next one hopefully won't be quite as long. Maybe I'll discuss just four or five books in the next video of this kind. And uh, before you go, I just want to draw your attention to the description box where you will find a link to my Patreon and also my cats and classic literature themed web shop. If you want to support me in these kind of difficult times, then check out those links. Thank you for watching. Bye.